Well, look at that. The time is here, my friends. Uh, it is 10 o'clock on the west coast of the United States. Ding! It is 0500 GMT, and it's Nerd News Monday, and I got a lot of good shit coming up this week, including impossible technology. Well, not just impossible technology in the basic way, but um, sort of things that were impossible, that were seemed impossible maybe 20 years ago, and turn out to be realities today. Um, the impossible engine of NASA, the impossible crystals from nature, uh, neural networks that actually work, whether artificial intelligence should make us scared or not, and disguised technology. We go from impossible technology to disguised technology. I'm fascinated by like cell phone towers that try to look like other things, even if it's bad. I'm fascinated by it. Uh, we'll look at uh, a, you know hidden cameras, hidden phone chargers, that kind of thing. But uh, let's start with the quasi-crystal, or what is it called? The impossible crystal, I believe, is what it was referred to in the, uh, the article here. But um, let's read this uh, from the folks at motherboard.vice.com. Quasi-crystals are nature's impossible matter. There's a difference, as a science teacher once told me, there is a difference between things that are matter and things that don't matter. Uh, he always thought he was so damn funny with that pun, and uh, he's obviously wrong, but I think it's cute enough to have quoted him here. What do a frying pan, an LED light, and the most cutting-edge camouflage world in the world have in common? Well, it depends on who you ask, but the substantial connection for these scientists is the impossible atomic arrangement discovered by Dan Schechtman in 1982. Basically, a quasi-crystal is a crystalline structure that breaks the periodicity meaning it has translational symmetry, or the ability to shift the crystal one unit cell without changing the pattern. What the fuck? Um, it's a, a normal crystal for an ordered yet aperiodic arrangement, meaning quasi-crystalline patterns will fill all available space, but in such a way that the pattern of its atomic arrangement never repeats. Um, these two scientists managed to simulate the most complex quasi-crystal ever. Let's look at it. There it is. The most complex crystal simulated. This is last Christmas Eve. Um, they say these findings help demonstrate how complexity can emerge from simple rules. The icosahedral quasi-crystal looks ordered to the eye but has no repeating pattern. That there has no repeating pattern. Uh, at the same time, it's symmetric when rotated like a soccer ball with five-fold and six-fold patches. Um, Icosahedral symmetry is a property found on small scales around a single point. It's in virus shells or buckyballs, molecules of 60 carbon atoms, but it's forbidden in a conventional crystal. Like trying to tile a bathroom floor with pentagons, icosahedra do not nicely fill space. Um, so you get a kind of good idea of what they're talking about. And this is a really cool article from fizz.org. Uh, from last uh, Christmas, which I feel like you can look at. The simulation will allow researchers for the first time to observe how icosahedral symmetry develops. I'm trying to highlight that. Uh, patterns here in the quasi-crystal simulated by Michigan engineering researchers reflect the golden ratio. The ratio is also found in the relationship of the distances of particle interactions. It's easy to, when reporting a story like this, get lost in exactly what it means or what its value is or what it does or what the hell you're talking about. Um, this happens to me when I talk about quantum computing all the time. Um, I really have trouble reporting any kind of quantum computing news story with any kind of understandability because it's so complex. It's related to the Fibonacci sequence, if you've heard of this. That's a simple progression of numbers beginning with 0 and 1 in which the next number is the sum of the previous two. The Fibonacci sequence. So one, 0, 1, 1, then 2, 3, 5, 8. Each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. This is a sequence visible in the arrangement of petals and flowers, seeds in a pine cone, branches and trees, and spirals of nautilus shells. Um, and they help answer fundamental questions important in all of nature. How do you get really complex arrangements of atoms and molecules from essentially local information? It's a beautiful example of something incredibly rich in structure emerging from very simple rules. So yeah, that Fibonacci sequence is an example of it. The golden ratio, which is about 1.61, is a mathematically and artistically important number first studied by the ancient Greeks. Um, 
And when researchers looked closer, they found the golden ratio governed these interactions with particles that only interact with up to three particle distances away. So, I mean, it's, it seems so simple at the beginning, yet it becomes so complicated so fast. Uh, and I wish I could get one of those, you know, um, if you've ever seen Michio Kaku, he's kind of that one scientist. Who, I actually interviewed Michio Kaku one time. Uh, he's a brilliant guy, obviously, but he has a way of turning very, very complicated scientific phenomena and theory and stuff into very, very basic, understandable, you know, sort of not quite kindergarten level understandability, but um, he does a good job of dumbing down the hardcore science for those of us who are not scientists. And uh, I really enjoyed my time interviewing Michio Kaku. These days he's kind of a media fixture and, and I mean, to call him not a scientist is obviously incorrect, but uh, pardon me. I've been talking a lot. I did another hour before this. My throat's a little bit hoarse, if you will. Okay, let's go back to the impossible crystal. This is the second article I was looking at. Oh man, I got my uh, trackpad wet here. I'm gonna have to fix that. Okay, um, let's go back to this and let's go back to this. Okay, so that's the most quasi, the most complex quasi crystal ever. There, the simulation thereof, and now we're talking about. Most of the current applications of quasi-crystals are rather mundane, such as the coating for frying pans or surgical utensils. What are they going to use this for? Well, coating for frying pans and surgical utensils. Um, the simulation of this self-assembling icosahedral quasi-crystal opens up new re research avenues and development, such as improved camouflage, uh, redirecting light to change the appearance of something, making camouflage materials or any kind of transformation optics materials is about controlling the structure of the material, controlling the spacing of the component materials to control the way light is absorbed and reflected. Um, an article like this really makes you wish there was at least an occasional picture. Uh, I guess this is the T-1000 shapeshifter in the Terminator. Um, it's not that the icosahedral quasi-crystal would necessarily be the structure you would shoot for in shape-shifting, but it represents the kind of complexity and control one would like to have over the building blocks of matter. If you understand what's required to get a certain structure, then you could imagine we could change conditions and change the structure we get. Everything about a material depends on its structure. Um, again, I, I wish there were more relevant photos here other than simply a electron diffraction pattern or a picture of the T-1000. Um, but, again, uh, there's Dan Sheckman. There's the guy who sort of discovered it. It's displaying a model. And uh, what is this? That's what order means. There was a correlation between how it looks in one place versus another. So this is a very deep article. The good folks at Vice.com came out with it. The date on it is May 3rd this year. Um, and it looks like, is this actually an hour on it? Is this, is that what this is? An hour from Radio you know Motherboard? Seconds, you don't throw the ball where the receiver is, you throw where he's going to be. All right, well, we don't listen to that. But, um, uh, so there's that. And I like the, uh, topic there. And I like sort of the image there of the ALPDRE, a lab-made quasi-crystal image. So that's one of them with, uh, pentagonal sides and stuff like that. It's pretty cool to look at. I mean, crystals are cool no matter what you're talking about, but especially quasi-crystals that sort of break certain rules and have certain things. I think that's really badass. Um, let's take a look at the NASA Impossible Engine while I'm uh, sort of trying to pull up the story here. I'll tell you, you're looking at Seabass After Dark. Um, this is the Nerd News Monday uh, version of the program where we cannot stop talking about nerdy things, technology, science, and everything in between. This article is called Physics Be Damned. We can't stop talking about NASA's impossible engine. So from impossible crystals to the impossible engine. This is from TheVerge.com last week. Um, imagine an engine with nothing powering it. No moving parts. Nothing appears to be coming out the back. And when you look inside, there's nothing there either. Oh, Lord. Red alert, folks. Red alert. Um, something just went off on my tablet, but fortunately, I can stop it. Um, the hypothetical premise behind the EM drive, the hypothetical space drive we've been promised one day might take us to Mars. Like the machine itself, the coverage keeps going and going. Experts say it's probably nothing more than wishful thinking and scientific error, but they still can't stop thinking about it. 
Um, people want the EM drive to be real for obvious reasons. It's cool, it's exciting, it's optimistic, ludicrously so. The drive was originally created by a British inventor who claimed that if you bounce microwaves around a sealed metal container just so, you could create thrust at one end. No moving parts, no propulsion, just thrust. Such an engine would be a godsend for space travel, letting scientists build spacecraft with all that heavy, finite rocket fuel and instead launch something simply with enough solar panels to keep the engine functioning. With a working EM drive, we can get to Mars in just 70 days, some have claimed, fulfilling that secular version of salvation, turning humanity into a multi-planetary species. Except, of course, for the physics. If the EM drive did work, it would be breaking some of the most fundamental and thoroughly tested physical laws, conservation of energy and momentum. The first of those states that you can't create energy out of nothing. The second says that to create movement, you have to have equal and opposite movement. Um... Scientists who have backed the EM drive are claiming to have created thrust from nothing, therefore breaking both of those laws at once. No gas coming out the end, nor anything as insubstantial as ions, which is how weak but real ion thrusters work, and yet they say the drive is creating thrust. It's like saying you can get your car moving by sitting inside and pushing on the steering wheel, says Sean Carroll of California Institute of Technology. He adds, none of the expectations for why the EM drive might function may make any sense, one of the theories states the drive is somehow gaining traction by interacting with the quantum vacuum. Okay. But this guy says that's meaningless. It's a complete misunderstanding of quantum field theory. The quantum vacuum has no inertia of its own. Appealing to it to help explain dodgy experimental results is just a bit of technobabble. Ah, technobabble. Something Trekkies certainly know and love um, enormously. So... But that didn't stop the story from spreading. In 2006, the guy got 250,000 pounds from the British government to build the machine. It ended up on the front cover of New Scientist. The accompanying article was quickly shot down by various scientists. The magazine itself admitted they should have seen they should have been clearer that the EM drive apparently contravenes the laws of physics. And Shire disappeared from the story, but the ball was simply fumbled forward. Um, in 2012, a Chinese team of scientists claimed they built their own working EM drive, producing a tiny amount of thrust without any propellant. It produced a bit of press coverage, nothing substantial. In 2014, a marketing executive turned inventor named Guido Feta said he would created his own version of the machine, rebrand the Kene drive that also worked. But his machine was tested by a small team of scientists from NASA Eagle Works, who said that, yes, amazingly, this thing was producing thrust, and while the drive seemed to be less powerful than the Chinese experiment, it was still staggering. With that, it really took off. A first report from Wired UK claimed NASA validates the impossible space drive. Various articles followed a similar theme, many of them taking an appropriately skeptical stance, but giving credence to some of the claims nonetheless. There's the prototype. But Discover Magazine pointed out in a thorough debunking of the entire concept, the science produced by NASA Eagle Works just doesn't stand up. Even ignoring various methodological ambiguities, especially over which parts of the test took place in a vacuum, the paper reported thrust was generated by a version of the EM drive that was designed not to work. Okay, that confuses me. The paper reported the thrust was generated by a version of the drive that was designed not to work? Um, the difference between the two drives is that one had slots engraved in one side designed to create an imbalance in the microwaves, and thus the theory goes thrust, while the other had no slots. The fact that both versions were found to be creating thrust could suggest the scientists involved don't quite understand what they've created or made a mistake. Um, does that make anybody else think of the Big Bang Theory when uh, Sheldon made a mistake in mathematics? He was off by a factor of 10,000 and yet uh, discovered an element and Chinese scientists confirmed it by sort of faking some of their data and all of that went on. Um, Sheldon was completely horrified of his success and was angry and unhappy and was getting raises and was on, you know, uh, Science Friday. Ira Flato even guest starred on NPR's Ira Flato. Uh, is it NPR? I don't think it is NPR. I think it's um, the other one, APM, American Public Media, has Science Friday with Ira Flato. Anyway, back to the article here real fast. It's the impossible engine, and they keep, they keep thinking it works. And so uh, people keep not dropping it. Um, a recent report revealed, let's see here, radio signals of terrestrial origin supposedly picked up by Australian telescopes actually originated from a staff microwave. 
Experimenters make small mistakes all the time. Uh, in the results, in the end, the results of this one mistake, neutrinos moving faster than light, were traced to some loose cables. So, it looks like it's really not true. The scientists keep telling us it's not, and yet experimenters and inventors keep claiming to have built it, and tests keep seeming to confirm it, even though we can't let it go. Uh, there was also another thing, and just let me pull up. I don't know if it was new enough to appear on Google News or not, but my buddy in Hawaii posted an article about flywheel energy storage. This is not an engine so much as a flywheel, and I think... Is it this one? This doesn't look like a site I've seen before. Ireland announces a new energy storage plant that is based on flywheels. Uh, how to store large amounts of renewable energy created during windy or sunny conditions for instantaneous use. The new hybrid flywheel energy storage is to be built at a site. This website doesn't appear to be loading properly, for one thing. That's why I hate going to freaking weird websites I've never heard of, because stuff cuts off. But this is about a month old. Electricity from renewable sources such as wind turbines or solar panels is used to spin the tube or flywheel at very high speed. Because it's near frictionless, it continues to spin efficiently until such time as the energy is required back in the electricity grid. At that point, the kinetic energy stored in the flywheel is used to generate power, which is fed back out onto the grid. Each flywheel is around two meters in height. They're buried in the ground to reduce visual impact. The hybrid flywheel will resist in disruption mitigation during times of unexpected demand or sudden fluctuations in energy supply. In other words, for solar, when it gets cloudy, for wind power, when it gets calm, when the wind calms. So there's some uh, yet new energy information going on and new energy stories happening. Speaking of impossible, let's talk about force fields and warp speed. No, not force fields and warp speeds, force field and transporters. Dr. Michio Kaku, this is again for 2000 days. This is actually even before I interviewed him. But he was saying it's possible within decades. That's sort of what he told me in my interview uh, when I was on the radio in San Francisco. Teleportation and force fields could become scientific realities. Time travel will also be possible in the future, according to Michio Kaku, who says he studied a range of scientific impossibilities and concluded most will almost certainly be achieved as our knowledge expands. Applying the rule that unless something breaks a law of physics, that, that it's not only possible, it's sure to be built someday. He's established a hierarchy of impossibilities separating those phenomena that are sure to remain science fiction from those which are likely to become reality. Class 1 are likely to be realizable. Class 2 may take centuries to perfect. Class 3 are truly impossible. And in Class 1, he puts teleportation, likely to be achieved through quantum entanglement, whatever that is, telepathy, made possible by improved MRI machines that can effectively read minds, and invisibility, which will be achieved using recently built metamaterial. We've covered metamaterial on this show. It's capable of bending light. Um, also, they're saying alien life will most likely be discovered within decades as our ability to analyze the universe improves. All right. Class two within millennia possible. Uh, time travel. Parallel universes and traveling faster than light. So warp speed in the next millennium, uh, according to Dr. Michio Kaku. And then the actual really, really impossible, impossible things, perpetual motion machines and precognition, both of which break the fundamental laws of modern physics. What is unthinkable today might not be forbidden in a few decades or centuries. And that got me thinking. Okay. We talked about the impossible crystal that turns out to be at least realizable in some theoretical way. We talked about the impossible engine, which again, isn't physically possible. It seems like it's in class three there from Michio Kaku, but uh, scientists keep trying and the media keeps latching onto it. And then, you know, how many things do we have today that are actually, were considered impossible even, I don't know, let's say 20 years ago. Well, I have an article to share with you. Here we go. 
um, from the folks at Business Insider, which is a website I do know and I do like. Let's go back to page one of it here so I don't ruin the, uh, the reveal. 10 things, every, 10 everyday things we have today that were impossible 20 years ago. Let's take a look at this article because, I mean, I think this is a good perspective, right? We're probably not going to get to precognition. We're probably not going to get to certain things. Certainly not in my lifetime. Warp speed probably will not be real in Seabass's lifetime. But, you know, the what's the, I forget even the name of the rule. Computing power is growing in exponential, you know, ways. Like, uh, was it Bill Gates who was quoted as saying, no computer will ever need more than 640K of memory? It's just absolutely inconceivable that a computer will need more memory than that ever in the future. Like, for one thing, what's he doing saying something like that? And for another thing, I mean, 640K is a laughable amount of memory. I don't care what kind of memory you're talking about these days. Um, and that's only been in like the past 20, maybe 30 years. So let's look at the 10 things, everyday things we have now that were impossible in 1995 or so. The iPod, your entire music collection in your pocket. Suddenly you can carry around more music than you can even physically listen to in a week and carry it with you everywhere. Of course, that's only gotten better since the iPod came out. In terms of capacity, the resolution of video displays, the ability to run apps, smartphones changed a lot of things that were completely impossible, you know, and one of the things I love about it is, you know, I got my Android and my iPhone. I actually have another device over there that I use as well. And I can carry around in my pocket, actually, where's my little media drive? Oh, at least it's over there. I have this little Wi-Fi media drive. I literally can carry around all of my favorite Star Trek movies. Entire series, you know, entire seasons of other series, entire series, depending on the series. And it's streamable over Wi-Fi on my phone. I mean, I don't have a very big storage on this iPhone. That's why I use that to stream a lot of storage. But, um, you know, if you have a big enough iPhone, you don't even need that separate gadget. But either way, such a thing was completely inconceivable 20 years ago. And comedian Patton Oswalt makes this point. Wouldn't you love to go back in time 20 years and talk to yourself? And he, the joke he makes is, oh, what are you listening to? My old Walkman. Oh, I remember that. Okay, now take the cassette out of that Walkman, snap it in half. All of the music you've ever, every song you've ever heard and every song you've ever liked and every song you will ever like is in a device the size of half of an audio cassette. And, uh, you know, that's the reality. The iPod changed the world in a very real way and it was completely impossible only 20 years ago. Um, what about this? Calling around the world for pennies a minute. Skype and other VoIP applications offer free client-to-client -client calling and super affordable client-to-phone calling. The UN Refugee Agency staffers use Skype to call away, call home from as far away as Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. Again, where you are in the world doesn't really matter. I was in Mexico for a year teaching English and Skype was a fantastic way of seeing my friends and family in the States and VoIP, just plain old audio VoIP applications were a fantastic way of just calling my mom whenever I felt like I wanted to call her. I was I had the VoIP app on my phone with a data plan and literally it's just like having a cell phone that can call internationally only how much does it cost? Zero. That's right. Um, it's pretty badass and international dialing from a cellular phone was not something possible 20 years ago. It was not really even conceivable for most of us. Um, let's look at what's next. Worthwhile hybrid cars. Interesting, right? Consumer hybrid car technology saw a hiccup when petroelectric motors ran out of money. I don't even remember hearing about that in the 70s. It wasn't until 2001 when the Prius came out. Now we've got Priuses and Nissan Leafs and everything else. They're still expensive, though. But the Tesla is coming. That's another big deal. 64-bit processors. That's what I was just talking about this. Moore's law, the idea that computing is, uh, computing idea that states processor speeds double about every two years. It's held true since 65. It's expected to stay true until at least 2020 or 2015, 2020. 64-bit processor is an amazing piece of processor design that can tear through computer calculations faster than 32-bit processors. Well, why would we build it if it couldn't? Burning a CD or DVD, uh, that was impossible 20 years ago. Think about that for a second. Burning a DVD 
or let's say a Blu-ray disc. Blu-ray discs were also inconceivable back then, but CDs are now not only burnable, it's almost passe. Uh, certainly digital data is not, but to burn something on a CD, an old school audio CD, I mean, most, unless you have an old car stereo, or, you know, I mean, even modern day computers don't include a CD or DVD drive built in anymore because, you know, they're, we're all going smaller and thinner and tablets don't have it. Like, I don't ha I have to connect a DVD drive in order to burn or read a DVD on this machine I'm broadcasting to you from. So, I mean, not only was burning a CD inconceivable 20 years ago, think about what it takes to make that technology sort of not obsolete, but you can see it from here. You know, you can see obsolete CD from here. What about the next one? Oh, I skipped one. A huge repository for the world's video content. Our friends at YouTube, in case you're watching this on tape, if you're watching the recorded version of Seabass After Dark instead of Seabass After Dark Live at 10 p.m. on the West Coast or 0500 GMT, it's actually 1026 and uh, 0526 GMT. But um, yeah, what's YouTube not have? I believe Dane Cook made a joke, comedian Dane Cook made a joke where he talked about how, you know, not only is there everything on YouTube, you could pound the keyboard with your fist and get GHJKL semicolon. And not only will there be something on YouTube with GHJKL semicolon, there'll be a kid wearing a GHJKL semicolon t-shirt and singing on the internet along with you know, Nicki Minaj or something like that. Like, I mean, it's really, really getting that ridiculous, the amount of content that's on YouTube. And it's increasing every day. Internet over the air, Wi-Fi routers. I mean, I'm trying to think. We did have the internet 20 years ago in 1995. I could check my email in 1996 when I first went to college. But uh, think about, I mean, I didn't have my cell phone yet. We didn't have 3G technology that lets you use the internet mobile. Uh and it's certainly, again, with the resolution and the ability to do increasing numbers of things. Oh, yeah, movie editing in your living room. This is something I saw coming. It was not quite what I envisioned, but you could see when I first had my first audio editing computer, which would have been 1986 or 7, digital audio, and the second you could see digital audio editing, and I mapped that in my brain to text right if you can create a text file in microsoft word and can control x cut control c copy and control v paste if you can cut and copy paste and manipulate text like that you can do that with any other kind of data including audio or video and these days i mean not only is that completely possible it's commonplace final cut pro alone they're saying it represents a real democratization of media production that can be good and bad, right? Uh, I don't know if you saw Outfoxed, the documentary about the Fox News Channel and how much bullshit it is. It's a good documentary. I, I watched it on my friend Hedros' TV channel or online streaming channel, but here's the problem with it. They use Final Cut Pro 7 to edit that. And Final Cut Pro 7, as most video things do, come with a certain number of templates, right? Preformed wipes for editing, um, you know, think of Star Wars when they have the wipe, the iris wipe that starts like a circle and opens out, or, uh, you know, the wipe from left to right, the wipe from top to bottom, the ways of supering a name on the screen or animating your names, how it comes onto the screen, the font it uses, all that stuff. It has meant, there's a million different ways of doing each of those functions in Final Cut Pro. And for some reason, the people who produced the Outfox documentary. This is getting a little bit insider baseball as far as production is concerned. Ever since I did that with my finger, the lighting is fucked up on this video now. Um, there it goes. Uh, here's my complaint about Outfox. Not that they're wrong. Of course they're right that the Fox News channel is a bunch of bullshit, claiming to be fair and balanced, but being not. But here's the problem. They decided to intentionally use every single editing wipe, every single font, every single live font, every single sort of bell and whistle trying to show off the, the flashiness of their documentary and look how technological and futuristic we are. The problem with that is that results in a very amateurish look overall. It looks like some kindergartner did it on Movie Maker on Windows. You know what I'm saying? And um, the real way of doing that 
is less is more. Pick a font, an animation style, a wipe, or a small subset of them that work together, that look good with each other, and then stick only to those. Uh, the reason being is it becomes too distracting for the viewer who's not understanding what they're seeing, and for the savvy viewer like me who knows what Final Cut has and offers and does, it's like, okay, really, is there not one wipe you're going to avoid using? Is there not one font you're going to skip just because you know you, you want it to look all flashy and interesting? It looks like an amateur thing. It's amateur hour. And so the democratization of filmmaking has its good side. Everybody's a filmmaker now, but Again, less is more. You want to sort of be reserved in it, and if you want to do it and look pro, don't use every fucking template in the basket. And I think pros would agree with me on that. All right, producing a movie in your living room, bing, bang, boom. DVR technology, of course. Uh, the good old TiVo, which is gone now, sadly. I don't think the TiVo is really there anymore, but... The DVR is certainly not gone. VCR programming wizards could vi videotape programs. That was me, by the way, yes. In the 80s and 90s, I was the one mom and grandma went to when they wanted to tape their soap operas or Law and Order, or whatever the show may be. Um, I was the one who understood how to program. Do you remember VCR Plus? I set my grandma up with VCR Plus. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going hoarse because... I get so excited and I continuously talk. VCR Plus was this bizarre technology that somehow got the folks at TV Guide involved. And the TV Guide people or the VCR Plus people generated like a 6 to 12 digit code for every show on every channel all the way across cable. Now, that is not how it is today. We didn't have 600 channels of nothing to watch. We had maybe 100, maybe 70 channels of nothing to watch on cable, but every show on every channel had a code, and it was all printed there in the TV guide, and somehow some fucking people coordinated that and made it so that every time you got a TV guide, every show that was listed had a number next to it, a 6 to 12 digit code, and you could pick up this pad and enter the code, and if it were programmed right, the VCR Plus would then learn how your VCR programs and would just automatically work. That was a bunch of horse shit. Like, that was so complicated, it was actually easier for me to write a page of instructions for my grandmother and paint. I literally used whiteout and painted one button on the remote control white so that my grandma would know which button to hit. You know, it was like the select button or something like that. And she could sort of work her way through it following my printed instructions. That VCR Plus thing was just a mind -blowing. And so you know, I think about how far we've come with DVRs today and TiVo of the past 10 years. God, I miss TiVo. TiVo was fantastic. Um, but, you know, and we've come so far from the VHS era of taping things that it's almost mind-boggling. And if I could, like, go back in time and tell myself, oh, that VCR Plus shit, man, you're going to be glad when it gets to be 20 years from now because it's going to be so effortless to record anything you want and large collections of it, by the way. If you want every Star Trek that's been on the past two weeks, there you have it. If you want to record everything that just has William Shatner in it, Star Trek or otherwise, it can do that. You know, it's, it, I mean, the DVRs are really, really sensational. And uh, again, completely unimaginable 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, too. Number 10, video chat. We sort of covered this in the previous VoIP category. But yeah, I mean, not just video chat, but FaceTime, right? Not just Wi-Fi, not just internet video chatting on computers connected with wires, but actually using it on your phone wirelessly and uh, walking down the street. Or uh, probably less wise to do video chatting in your car while you're driving, but it's not impossible technologically. Um, all of those advancements happened over the past 20 years. And I had other articles, too. Uh, that was from 2011. <clears throat> and here's a whole other websites. Five mind-blowing ways science has done the impossible. Is this this is from crack.com. This may be like a joke. Five recording your fantasies and dreams. I don't know what that is. Oh, I see. UC Berkeley developed a way to literally see what your brain sees and did it by manipulating the magic of YouTube. Huh. Okay, whatever. I th I think this is bullshit actually. Um 
teleporting information. All right, maybe it's not bullshit. Um, this is not my favorite article that we're talking about changing, creating black holes. That's not useful, or you know, for most people. Uh, and last, creating something from nothing. All right, I'm over that article. That article is not as interesting as what I'm talking about or what I'm trying to do. Um, Crack.com does this weird thing where they walk the line, kind of walk both sides of the line. Unlike The Onion, which is all satire, or news sites, which are all supposedly as true as they can be, that Crack.com seems to be half bullshit and half real. Um, let's look at NewScientist.com. I trust that website. I've been there before. Ten of possibilities cover, conquered by science. Um, analyzing stars. This is going to be as un unrelatable to the regular person as the previous one from Cracked, I guess. Meteorites coming from space. Heavier than air flight. Space flight. Uh, harnessing nuclear energy. Warm superconductors. Okay. Seven black holes. Okay, Cracked actually touched on black holes. Donuts. No, that's an ad. Uh, creating force fields. Here we go. This is one of the ones I wanted to talk about. Michio Kaku referenced it, but we didn't hear much about it. This classic of science fiction went from wild speculation to verifiable fact in 1995 with the plasma window. Brookhaven National Lab. The plasma window used a magnetic field to fill a small region of space with plasma or ionized gas. The devices are used to reduce the energy demands of electronic, electron beam welding. The plasma window most of the properties we associate with force fields. It blocks matter well enough to act as a barrier between a vacuum and the atmosphere. It also allows lasers and electron beams to pass through unimpeded and will even glow blue if you make the plasma out of argon. Oh shit, that is tremendous. The only drawback is it requires huge amounts of energy. Well, how are force fields not going to create huge amounts of energy, you know? Uh, invisibility, another staple of science fiction. Nothing in the laws of physics says invis invisibility is impossible, and invisibility cloaks have been experimented with basic design in 2006, again with metamaterials. And last but not least, teleportation. Again, we're talking about quantum phenomena called entanglement. I think what they're tr teleporting is information and not, you know, Star Trek transport. You're not beaming a person or an object to another place. You're sort of shooting information in another way, but I guess the people who know suggest that that's the first step, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, we're talking about impossible things on Nerd News Monday, and I feel like that's one of the ways in which the impossible is really good to look at, is look at 20 years ago, 30 years ago, what we were doing and what we couldn't do, what we thought was absolutely impossible. Our predictions for the future then reflect a lot. Or like Lisa Simpson said about uh, Epcot Center at Disney World. I believe the line was something like, oh, that's what the people of 1966 thought 1989 would be like. Uh, you know, <laughs> when people were looking at the, you know, people in the past were looking into the future, but only 30 years into the future, and we're now well past that, and it's pretty funny. Okay. Let's shift gears a little bit. This is Seabass After Dark. It's Nerd News Monday. We're hanging out. We're having a good time talking about things that are impossible, or we were talking about things that were impossible. Uh, we can go back in time and talk about it some more, except I have other things I wanted to talk about. Neural networks. Neural networks. What are they? What are they? Well, I mean, we talked a lot about artificial intelligence. Um, Stephen Hawking and other prominent scientists say it's scary and that we'll be lucky. I believe it was Marvin Minsky from MIT who said we'd be lucky if the artificial intelligences we create will keep us around even as pets. Um, other people are excited about AI, but neural networks that actually work as far as storage, as far as computers, uh, it's pretty fascinating shit. Um, let me pull up the article, Neural Networks. And finally, neural networks that actually work. Okay, let's look at this article here. I will switch you over to it and you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, huh. Bing, bang, boom. Okay. Oh, there's the last story, disguised technology. We will cover that in the last 10 minutes of the show. By the way, do call in, tweet. This is not meant to be me rambling on. Uh, 
I realize it's sort of old school to ask people to call in, but I do have a phone number. My phone is right here. It's not ringing. Uh, I accept calls on this show a lot more than I accept calls on the other show I do sometimes because, um, well, I feel like there's less of a chance of crazy people. So 310-776-5869. The last four digits, 5869, spell K-U-N-Z. This is my name on Twitter. Comment on the video below if you're watching on uh, the recording. Uh, I'm reachable just about every way. You can certainly Google search me and find it. All right, finally, neural networks that work from the folks at Wired.com as of about a month ago. I'm going to take a sip and we'll delve into this for a few minutes. Jeff Dean built an artificial brain as a senior at University of Minnesota. Using what was considered a supercomputer at the time, he mimicked the network of neurons inside your head and created a system that could analyze information and even learn. The trouble was it didn't work that well. The computers didn't provide enough juice. They couldn't juggle enough data. We just trained it on toy problems, he says, of this neural network. Computational power wasn't all that great. But this was 25 years ago before he went to Google and changed the very nature of computational power. As one of the earliest Google engineers, he created the fundamental computing systems that now underpin Google's vast online empire, systems that span tens of thousands of machines. This work gave him celebrity-like status among Silicon Valley engineers. People recognize him as he walks through the Google cafeteria. Now armed with those massively distributed systems and the ideas that drive them, he's returned to the world of neural networks. This time, artificial brains do work well. He's building neural nets that can identify faces in photos, recognize spoken words, even understand natural language. And many other tech companies are doing the similar thing, from Microsoft to Facebook to Twitter. The basic algorithms aren't much different than the ones in the 80s. We just have the power now that computers need to make it do it well and quickly. I've always believed human learning is the result of relatively simple rules combined with massive amounts of hardware and massive amounts of data. And now we have that says Sebastian Thrun, the ex-Googler who oversaw the self-driving car project, which can also benefit from neural networks. In the 90s, Dean was a researcher at DEC, which made big computing systems that ran big businesses, but the DECs were imploding. He moved to Google and was among the small team who realized we could generate far more power by stringing together thousands of small machines. Hello, what is that starting to sound like? Stringing together smaller things to make a bigger thing that can sort of combine the power that sounds like the human brain um, to me I was only in psychology school for a relatively short time but I know enough to know that essentially each brain cell has life but not intelligence but you have a hundred billion of them together that's something process data across all machines as though they were one big computer Tools were the secret weapons that enabled Google's search engine to serve millions across the globe. Others started using similar tools, and now they can identify the voice commands you bark into your phone. In Microsoft, similar neural net, uh, at Microsoft, similar neural nets underpin a new Skype tool that translates instantly one language to another. Hello, hello Trekkies, are we hearing something sounding familiar there? Instantly translating one network to another, or one language to another. That would be the universal translator that Captain Kirk waved around. It looked like an old-fashioned microphone, strangely. That was just a prop. Now we have it for real. Um, targeted ads, brain-like algorithms, deep learning is the catch-all term for this. And in the years to come, it will remake far more than just Skype and other products. Like Thrun, Dean says, we can improve our self-driving cars, helping them better understand the world around them. If it can help cars learn, it can help other machines learn. In other words, sentient robots are probably coming down the road. Let's look at robots. Is it Lowe's that has a robot? I think so. Can we see the Lowe's robot? Here we go. I guess they're just testing it in California, but check this out. Uh, that would be an ad. Okay, let's say fuck the ad for a second. I don't like having people look at the ad. And the comments, by the way, are always kind of funny. This is it. Robots are taking over. First, the auto industries. I'm going to piss on the fucking robot if it comes to the lows near me. Also, never stop hunting for someone to help you in the store. There may soon be a robot to the rescue. I'm Jen Markham on Buzz 60. 
Lowe's is testing out what it's calling a robotic shopping assistant in one of its Orchard Supply hardware stores, a chain acquired by the home improvement retailer last year. Okay, so it's Bosch. I am Oshbot. What are you looking for today? Besides greeting customers, the Oshbot can also answer questions. I'll take you to the plum 16-ounce flat contoured handle hammer in two languages. You might think of a study Initiate video conferencing when someone needs additional help. <laughs> and use a built-in 3D scanning camera to identify products. Can you place the object in my viewfinder? Is this the item you are looking for? Yes. I'll take you. Lowe says it will begin testing two robots at the San Jose, California store before the holidays, but there's no plan yet to put robots in every store nationwide. It's cute, but I think I speak for a lot of wives out there. When this technology we better use on a customer rather than the product. Like if my husband walks in asking for pipes and a wrench, he can do one little scan on his big dumb face and go, why don't you call a plumber? <laughs> All right. You know what? A lot of those smart ass little cutesy news things uh, do not amuse me. That one did. Um, scan the husband's face and determine he needs not pipes and a wrench, but needs to call a fucking plumber. Uh, that's funny as shit. Other robots. Um, my sister and I saw, it was a Honda commercial where they show Osimo. You know Osimo? The little, uh, like, astronaut looking robot. Um, let's just do an Osimo video here. Uh, here's Osimo. Will human sur will machines surpass humans? Oh my God! NHK World presented this. It's a Japanese news network in English. Welcome. This way. So does it creep you out, or I mean, it moves out of the way if humans walk in it, walk toward it. Like it's like, excuse me, sorry. Um, it converses using artificial intelligence. Oolong tea, Mr. O'Hare. Coffee, Mr. Oga. Milk tea, Mrs. Um. How about that? Uh, there's something that you never really hear bragged about much. All three of them said what they wanted at once. All three of them. And it understood that. Like, that's pretty badass. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty interesting that, you know, it understands multiple utterances in a very, I don't know, um, I think that's fascinating as hell. The fact that all three people can talk at the same time and the robot can understand all three things. Um, but again, you know, a lot of people look at Osimo and see the robots from iRobot with Will Smith, right? Where it all takes a little bit of hacking for the robot to like start killing people or doing whatever, right? And I mean, I guess that's probably the fear that such a thing will always face. Of course, self-driving cars will have that. Uh, we just today, just today in the news, and I don't think it's true. Let's go back to the web for a second. I'm going to pull up. I mean, I'll pause. We'll look at more Osimo in a minute. we got about 10 minutes left. Let's go to the news and look at the article about the guy who claims to have hacked the airplane. Um, I'm telling you this is bullshit because, for one thing, the kinds of airplane he was on are not hackable. They don't have fly-by-wire. Um, United Air Hack. Uh, now, the, the United Airlines people are offering for certain hackers free miles if they can find security weaknesses on their website. But the other thing is, this security researcher, according to Gizmodo, claims to have commandeered a flight in midair. He claims to have made the airplane fly either sideways or at least veer briefly sideways by hacking in through the in-flight entertainment system. Uh the reason I was thinking about this was that I don't think it's true because 737s and 757s are not fly-by-wire. 
And uh, even if you can hack the in-flight entertainment system, there ain't a way in. There's You can't get there from here. There's no way to hack into the computer because the, the control surfaces of the airplane are controlled manually. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting that the, the, this guy is claiming... He has been banned from all United flights for life. So, that sounds like United is seriously scared of him. On the other hand knowing what I know, it's like there was an episode of the uh, sitcom Modern Family where Luke, the son, is staring at a ball floating in the swimming pool. And his mom's like, come on, Luke, it's time to go. He's like, not now. I'm making the ball move with my mind. And it's the wind, you know? Like, the if the plane started going sideways, it's likely that it was... He doesn't know the pilot didn't turn the wheel sideways. He's in the fucking passenger compartment, you know? Like, I feel like that's a story we're going to find out. This guy's full of shit and looking for uh, his own, you know, his own kind of... Uh, he wants to be interviewed on TV. He wants to be famous. He wants to be known, and that's what that is. I want to look at a little bit more of what Asimo can do here. Touches the drinks, carries them with agile fingers. Those fingers do look very agile. Decides what to do without human control. Osimo was created by Honda's research and development subsidiary. We were allowed to film their top secret robotics laboratory. I love that. Japan is a worldwide leader in the development of humanoid robots. Asimo can hop on one foot. Crowning achievement. Engineers continue to make improvements. Asimo's most innovative feature is its advanced intelligence. The robot can think and act on its own without human intervention. That's made possible by sensors that replicate our five senses. Asimo's head contains eight microphones. It uses them to listen and engage in conversation. Okay, so he doesn't always understand, but he can say he doesn't understand. Work his eyes. They can detect humans and use stored data to identify them. No facial recognition problem. Face register 2. I don't think so. But please cover your face. Asimo's artificial intelligence analyzes a vast array of information. That's how it understands people's requests and takes appropriate actions. Okay, so well, I'm going to pause it. I don't. I didn't really want to watch the whole thing here, but I just to watch a little bit of Osimo, just so we can see robots are you know really awesome, um, and are growing in intelligence and ability to do things. The one thing that robot lacks, and I think, and we we found this when we watched iRobot, right? The the movie with Will Smith was a face. That robot looks like an astronaut, partially because it's got this big, dark shield in front of it. And I mean, it's got this backpack as well. So I think that probably to make a robot look like something familiar is step one. You want it to be recognizable and look harmless. So they make it short. So it looks like a little kid, you know, um, in an astronaut suit or something like that, a space suit. Um, you want it to be non-threatening. Uh, certainly it can do a lot with gestures when you saw the guy walk into the building it sort of did a welcome you know like a welcome thing welcome mr so-and-so of an hk follow me and then you sort of used hand gestures but part of the thing and i've said this ever since the 80s there's a robot movie that is my favorite robot movie because of the face of the robot the uh, expressiveness of the robot and the robot is johnny five aka number five from short circuit i'm gonna see off the top of my head here, I did not plan to do this, but Johnny Five Robot. Let's just see, is there any sort of clip of Short Circuit on? Because here's the thing, uh, many people in real life have now 
in the same way people have there's like whole clubs devoted to people building an r2d2 a full-size r2d2 replica i've interviewed r2d2 you can see pictures on my facebook page of me a microphone and r2d2 and um the thing about that is that r2 doesn't talk so it's hard to interview him but as a guy with a remote control controlling the rotating of the body controlling the rotating of the head the twinkling of the lights little various appendages that can extend um I'm scrolling through the different Johnny. I'll let you see what I'm seeing here really fast. We're about to wrap up. We're five minutes away from closing this down. But uh, Johnny Five the robot had an incredibly articulated face. Um, and that's the part that I feel like nobody... Well, let's look at this clip from the Short Circuit movie. And you can sort of see what I'm talking about. Short I Circuit. I won. I won. Oh, good I won. Lord. Not again. With the ads uh yes always depends uh undergarments there the great michael mckeon let's skip forward to when it comes out of the box okay you can sort of see the side there you can see the little eye shields there that look that function as eyebrows and eyelids kind of combined um, those things can actually look angry if they point them the right direction or not. The actual eyes themselves can extend or turn red. See that? They can go up or down here. They can look up or down. Uh, the little mouth blinks. These little vents on the side can extend. or like th This it, it does so many different things, and the result is a surprisingly expressive All face. All natural granola brownies. No preservatives or additives. Oh, mm. That's the real one. That's the real number two. Uh, Number five. Number five. Please, call me Johnny Five. Johnny, you have taken name for yourself? Oh, I choose many things for myself, but did not choose traveling in a box. So, yeah, I mean, there's the robot that I love above almost all robots. I think the one robot I probably like more because of my childhood attachment to it is the robot from Lost in Space. Danger Will Robinson, right? Now, that one didn't have as much of a face. It just had blinking sort of head and eyes that kind of glowed and a mouth that blinked. But, um, you know, the robots are getting better all the time. The one thing I feel like Osimo is lacking is a kind of expressive face. If we can, And the thing I know about it, Sid Mead, if you know anything who Sid Mead is, he's the one who designed the Johnny Five robot. Um, and that face and the head and sort of the, uh, the mechanism underneath that allows it to turn left and right, to tilt, to look up and down, you know, all those functions are very lifelike. And it took, I think, three different robot operators to make the original Johnny Five in that first movie work. What we saw there was from the second movie. And by then, they had a person in a, a, like a sort of suit where they would move their arms and their head and make the robot would replicate those motions. So they got it down to one person operating the robot off camera in the second movie, which is a much sillier movie. That first movie is the movie I like the best. Um, Anyway, I feel like we didn't really get to everything because I got to talk about robots. And once I'm talking about robots, I cannot shut up. But uh, essentially, uh, that's it for nerd news this week. If you have anything you want to continue or you want me to mention, please drop me a line at the phone number you see on the screen. Text me. Send me a tweet. Uh, put a comment on the video here. Whether it's live or later, you can comment on the videos on YouTube. And I'm able to do that. I'm, I'm not as able to look in live chatting as I wish I could because it's hard enough to juggle all this shit and try and keep some kind of train of thought. Maybe you've noticed I tend to ramble at times anyway. Um, oh, disguise technology. We didn't get to that. Real fast. This is only a single article, so we will stop with this article because this is the last thing. But I actually have this up already. It'll be fast. Um, disguised technology. All we got to do is look through this because there's Southern Arizona a saguaro cactus hiding a cellular tower. That's pretty goddamn realistic looking, frankly. Excuse me. Um, brought to you by Belch Beer. There's one hidden in a tree. Now, that doesn't look as good as the real trees around it. But if you're not looking close, you might not notice. Again, uh, it looks a little bit off, but it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look as bad as I guess. I mean, I don't have a problem with regular cell phone towers, but I guess some people do. Here's a camera on wheels that they sent into a uh, penguin community and they got it to fit in and, and they, they scientists wanted to study interaction within the penguin community and this little rover 
with a fuzzy bird thing on it was able to allow interaction and see things in the penguin community unlike they had ever been able to do before. The one above was one of the more realistic ones, I guess. Okay. And then here's a Starbucks latte. No, it's a Frappuccino. No, it's actually a battery pack for charging your phone. Um, I don't know what the necessary, why you wouldn't just get a regular battery pack, but it's cute. It's funny. It's simple. And it fits right in the cup holder of your car. Uh, this camera is disguised in a tie. That I like for spying purposes. Um, hidden cameras are in everything from glasses, pens, and watches. I like, look how tiny that is. You cannot see that in the fabric of that tie. It's pretty badass shit. All right. Well, now I feel like I've covered just about everything we're going to cover. Tomorrow is Game Show Tuesday. Be here for that. I got a multi-cam view of the Price is Right. What? Okay, you know when you see like a control room of a TV and you see like 18 different video feeds and you wonder how the director can look at all of them and see something and then choose one and select it in order that that be, you know, directors are pretty amazing people. I worked with several TV directors in my time and holy shit, the stuff they're able to do. Anyway, I got a six, you can see six cameras at once watching. It gives you a really great view of how The Price is Right is put together. We will look at that tomorrow night in addition to an old classic black and white game show, which I love to do. We're over my time. It's been over an hour. Comment, link, tweet, share. Uh, do participate as much as you can because I feel like it's better when it's not just me yammering. And all, have a great Monday night, everyone. This is Seabass After Dark.